Repent, sinners. Turn so you don't burn in the fires of a hot, hot hell. Most sermons in the United Church of Christ do not begin that way. (laughs) Nor do they end that way, and nor is that what you typically would hear in the middle. And I'm good with that. Most of us in this stream of the tradition recognize that the God revealed by Jesus does not seem like a God who wants people to experience eternal conscious torment in the flames of a place called hell. We say that Jesus reveals and understands that God is love. And so it is. At the same time, I also recognize there can be, of course, the reaction against the sort of message I started with. And then we can lose sight, though, of maybe some pieces of some of the language or the story that is still potentially speaking to us or with us or through us, like that word repent. I mean, if anyone comes up to you, say you're shopping, out for lunch, walking on the loop, and they came to you and said, repent, how would you feel? Well, you'd wonder about, are they okay, maybe, right? But still, it's not received as, oh, thank you so much, right? That's not usually how we hear that word. But it is a word that you heard a couple of times in the various scripture readings this morning. It is when Jesus starts his ministry and says the good news, the reign of God's at hand. In that first sentence, he also says, repent, repent. So the word, and we've talked about this before, it can mean something. It's not a religious word in its own context. I mean, it's just, it's a regular old word in the Greek that can mean something like turn around or make a U-turn. And I remember the first time this word had come up when I was preaching here, I shared for me the example of how whenever I am eastbound on Ina and want to turn left on Oracle, I resist and resent that I'm called to repent. (laughs) And there's even another traffic light, right? The turning around, It it really literally can mean something as simple as that. And there's also, though, the etymology of the words, it can mean or be understood as go beyond the mind you have. Go beyond the mind that you have. And I find those ways of thinking about the word perhaps helpful and therefore instructive and can help us make sense of what might have been the intent and meaning of such words in the stories that we heard this morning. So the first story we heard comes from Jonah. And Most people, if they've grown up in church traditions, know something about Jonah. Usually, oh, it's the guy who is in the belly of a whale. Does that sound familiar? But not all of us necessarily know or recall the context of that part. So I'll give you a little little, uh, uh, Reader's Digest version of Jonah. So Jonah is a prophet, and that means that he is listening for how God is still speaking. He is committed to practices of listening, and he is committed to sharing what he hears and receives. And often, that can challenge his own people. It can challenge the status quo. It's a risky job to to offer that prophetic ministry. Well, in the book of Jonah, Jonah, he gets a message while he's listening that challenges him. During the time of Jonah, he lives in a northern kingdom called Israel, there's the southern kingdom of Judah, and the biggest threat to the northern kingdom of Israel is the Assyrian Empire. And the largest city in the Assyrian Empire is called Nineveh. And so as Jonah is listening for God still speaking, God says, hey Jonah, could you do me me a favor? Would you please go to Nineveh? The ways they're living, it's going to mess everything up. It's going to destroy and ruin everything. I don't want that for them. So you go, tell them to turn around so they don't live into that destruction. God is telling Jonah, go love your enemies. These are the enemies. And so from everything Jonah knows and understands about society, about the world, about life, if your enemies are already going to destroy themselves, let them do it. Right? Wouldn't that be better? Like it seems good to Jonah. Just leave well enough alone. 
So Jonah is afraid of doing this for likely lots of reasons, and so he decides to try to run away from God. God being, you know, everywhere, that's a tough sell. But in the story he does, and there's this interesting notion that we might think about in the biblical language or understanding God's creator and creative energy comes in connection with God, and so in separation from God, the creation can come undone. It's more of chaotic energy, and so destructive, like for the Ninevites, they're living in separation, they're living something destructive. So then Jonah, he's choosing to now separate himself from God, and so instead of living in that creative spirit and energy, well, he's living now in something chaotic. And in the Bible, one of the primary symbols in the biblical literature for chaos is a sea. And the, the amping up of that image is a stormy sea. And so Jonah in the story ends up in a ship on a stormy sea. A symbol of he's trying to live, alienated, separated. It makes a mess of things. But then Jonah, he recognizes, though, that his choices are creating chaos for other people. And he doesn't really want to do that. So Jonah turns around, at least a little bit. He would have been stubborn. He's going to flee. He's, going to, he's like, oh, this is messing up other people. And so I'm going to choose to offer myself to let go so that they're not all destroyed. <clears throat> so he ends up being pitched overboard into the storm. And then a fish swallows him. It doesn't say whale. It doesn't really matter. Rifles. But so he's swallowed up by a fish. And if we think about in these biblical images and metaphors, in the stormy seas, there's times where Jesus walks on the water, the Israelites cross through the Red Sea water. So there's a picture of Jonah choosing to turn around is being conveyed through the storm, this time by a fish. But he is preserved from the chaos. And then he's spat out onto a Mediterranean beach where it seems that Jonah has a good long think. And at pondering, in the pondering, he discerns, it would seem, that while God may ask you to do hard things, life with God, life with what is creative and life-giving is better than life without, which is, can be chaotic and destructive. So Jonah starts listening again. And notice, if you were reading through the story, God does not say, too late for you, sick of you, you unfaithful little whatever. But God is still speaking. God is still willing. Jonah, thank you for tuning in. And so also what's happening here is Jonah has repented. He himself has turned around. He was trying to do it his own way. It wasn't working out. And so he's letting go of his version of what's good. It seemed good to not go help your enemies. That seemed good. But now he's letting go of his version of good and willing to do what God's calling him to do. And so God knew what God was doing in the story. We heard this part today, Nineveh, big old city. Jonah just gets a third of the way into the city with his message, and the whole thing catches like wildfire. It spreads. And these people were ready to turn around. They were hoping for some good news, it appears, and they do it. And in case anyone's confused, the king decrees, you should do this. And so we hear that as they turn around, instead of chaos, they're now moving in the way of what's creative, in the way of God. And so Jonah's version of good, which might have ended up with lots of destroyed Ninevites, he lets go of his version of good, and he seeks to be faithful to God, and it's better. Because also, if the Ninevites had stayed tuned in with God, they won't later. But if they had, well then, they wouldn't have been the enemy anymore, would they? Right? I mean, that's part of that strategy. If you actually love your enemy, and they experience something of the divine, then they may not be your enemy anymore. And so there's this picture, not so much of repent being like, you are evil, nasty little worms. Some of us grew up with that theology. But rather, most of us were doing the best we know how. It seems good to us. It seems reasonable. But there's this invitation to turn from that, to let go of what seems good, to be part of God's better. And that's what's going on in the gospel story as well. So Jesus, because if, if, if repent was just about you're already just evil and yucky, well, then why did Jesus engage a baptism of repentance? Jesus himself turned around, turned, went beyond the mind he had. So maybe, we don't know what he really did for those 30 years. Probably reasonable, decent things. But that Jesus, whatever that was, whatever society and culture told him he should do or be, he lets go of that version of good and trusts God's better. And so he starts living into that, and this is Mark's beginning of that story, 
And as he's living into that, we have Rabbi Jesus. So one thing we probably know is he was studying and is seen as a teacher in his community. He comes along a beach, and there are people who are fishing. And we've talked about this in more detail in the past. I won't go into all of the reasons for it at the moment. But in in the time of Jesus, a rabbi was a really elevated role. People really respected rabbis. And when that's the case, there are people, especially young men, who would want to be seen as worthy of studying under a rabbi. Well, these guys who are fishing, what we already know is, in their society and culture, they were not seen as worthy to study under a rabbi. And that's why they are now apprenticed to dad and they're fishing. They're taking on the family business because that was the normal thing that you did. So now you've got a rabbi coming down the beach who says, come follow me. He's saying to them, I believe you have what it takes. I think you can be like me. I think you can do what I'm doing. Well, that's impressive. That would be a, an interesting invitation at the very least. But it's also calling them the language, put down your nets. They've lived already a certain way, a good way. It is not evil or bad to be fisher people. Those who like seafood say amen. Right? But it's not a bad thing. So it's not that they're evil or bad, but Jesus is calling them to let go of their version of good and come with him and help fish for people, is the language he uses. Help people to live into the reign of God. More justice, more love, more mercy. And so these stories help us understand that repent is not the way, the tone I gave it at the beginning. That's not how Jesus is using it. That's not how the stories are using it. There's just the recognition that we live in ways that are the best we usually know to do. And some of us, maybe that's done real harm, and other times it's just kind of benign, or it's, some of it's been pretty good. But we're invited to be part of something better, something more. We're invited, and it's not a once and done. It's not a one, I repented once, the end. It's really a daily practice. It's a turning, like that plant I saw that had multiple times of turning in its leaf. I don't know what had happened, but it had done some turns. And it was marvelous and beautiful and amazing. And there's this reminder that that is part of the journey. There is good news. The reign of God is at hand. We can live immersed in the power and presence of God's Spirit. We can live in ways that are more generous and more just and more healing and more helpful but we also have to choose our part, and that's the turn. That's the go beyond some of our usual ways of thinking. At times, letting go of my version of good to be part of what might even be better. I have a really mundane example that came to mind. It was a Christmas season. I was in a church where my office was on the second floor, and I had this big pile of books that uh, there was this library. We did not have the great library like you all have here. So I would take books off my shelf and put them on a table near the sanctuary for people to check out, kind of newer titles, etc. So I was doing that. There were some Christmas Advent things. I was, so I had this big stack of books. I'm coming down the stairwell, and a woman's coming up the stairs, and she said, oh, there you are. I have a Christmas present for you. And in my head, I was about to say, could you just stack it on top of the book? And she said, we're heading out of town. I would love for you to open it now. But I'm doing a good task, right? I'm taking care of, I was on my own little mission. But one of my daily prayers is God help me to see ways that I can both receive your gifts and be your gift. Well, Michael, literally the person's offering you a gift and so my task had value, but what was better? This relationship. And so I said, hold on, let me set these down. I set them all down. And she had a story that went with a gift about why it was meaningful to her. And it was tender and beautiful. And you know what? The book still got downstairs. And that was, in that openness, being better, being part of God's better, letting go of my good, right? It wasn't an evil thing, but letting go of my good in the moment and letting that be my intention so I could be part of God's better. And it wasn't just better for me, it was also better for her, it was better for us. That's how God's better works. That what is best for you and for me becomes what's best for more of us collectively. And so I think about, too, sometimes we make those turns because we're just deeply curious. 
Or sometimes we're compelled by an invitation into something that we see is good and creative. Sometimes, though, and maybe more often, it's because whatever we're doing isn't working so well or it doesn't feel so great. Sometimes it's in the place of challenge that we're willing to entertain other possibilities. So I think about there's a finance meeting after, budget meeting. We have a challenge of a deficit, and that's really hard especially for all the officers and finance people who had multiple meetings trying to talk about presenting and what do we do and how does that work. But it's also an opportunity to go beyond the mind we have. It's an opportunity to make other turns. So whether that's individually thinking about my own commitment to my faith community or my own generosity, but also all of us collectively, what might we do or how might we be that we've not yet thought of? What better thing might God even have in mind for us? It's always a reminder to me at those crossroads, that's a good time to listen for how God is still speaking so that we can be part of God's better. And when we're ever part of God's better, it's better for you, for me, and for all of us. And that's good news. Praise God. Amen.